All right, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, today, we are going to discuss front end error monitoring basics with Sentry. Uh, so I, my name is Ben Pevin. I am on the product marketing team here at Sentry. And uh, Dirk uh, is a sales engineer at Sentry, and he'll be running us through uh, front, air, front air monitoring best practices and tips and tricks for getting started. Dirk, if you want to go to the next slide, please. So introduce yourself in the chat. Uh, let's keep things engaging and casual. Ask questions throughout the presentation. Uh, share where you're located, what company you're working at, even your favorite ice cream flavor. Um, and Dirk, if you could go to the next one. So just to give you a quick overview of what we'll be talking about today. So this webinar is geared towards people who are just getting started with front end, front end air monitoring with Sentry, or if you want a quick refresher on some best practices. Um, and we're going to try and do this all under 20 minutes, hopefully around 15, uh, if Dirk is able to speed through it. And then we're going to uh, open it up for Q&A for the last 10 minutes of the presentation. And if you have to uh, run out for some reason, we will be posting this to YouTube and we'll send a follow-up email in the next few days. Uh, so, as I said before, if you're getting started with Sentry or you just need a refresher on best practices, um, that's what we're going to go through today, some tips and tricks on how to get started and also how to use some of the context you're going to see on an issue details page once you have all of uh, the Sentry SDK installed, the source map set up, code mappings, etc. We're going to run you through some key uh, uh, Cont contextual info you're going to find on an issue details page. We're also going to run through a uh, session replay and also some tips and tricks for triaging, uh, automatic uh, assignment to issue owners, and then also best practices for cutting down on noisy alerts for your front end project and making sure that you're notifying the right person at the right time. And as I said, 10 minutes at the end for Q&A. So as I said, we're gonna try and get through this all, uh, the, the meat of Dirk's presentation, 15 to 20 minutes. So with that, Dirk, let's do yeah, it. Absolutely. Well, hello, everyone. Thanks. <clears throat> hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. We're gonna go through this rather quickly. So just bear with me, jot down your questions as we go along. Um, hopefully it won't be, uh, hopefully it will be very clear what we're trying to accomplish. I'm in Century right now. Uh, what I have today is essentially a blank environment uh, with one project that is a backend API. So this API is already set up. And our scenario today is I have a front end API that's, uh, excuse me, a front end application that's accessing this API. And I want to instrument that with Sentry for errors as well as performance. This particular webinar is more oriented on errors, but we'll add performance in as well, just so you can see what that looks like. So if I want to now add a front end, it's as simple as clicking this create project button. We give you a number of frameworks that you can choose from. These are our most popular. They're probably about 140 or so. This happens to be a React project. So we're going to use uh, choose React. And I'm going to leave my alert frequency alone. This will alert me on every new issue that comes in from this project. And it will do so via email. So via the email you've registered with Sentry. Later in this, once we wire up our application, I will change this over so that it also alerts me in Slack, which I have up here. And you can see my Slack channel is completely blank right now, nothing in it at all. So I'm gonna change this name just to be consistent with what I have been using on this project, which is images. Feel free to call this whatever you like whenever you set yours up. And you do need a team to create a project. You can't do it without it. Uh, so I'm going to use my React front end team. If you need to create a team, you can do so with this little plus button here. And now I'm done. That's all that's needed to create a project in Sentry. What I need from this screen, uh, this is essentially boilerplate React code. We will generate this for any application type that you are firing up, whether that's mobile, React, or anything else. I already have this init saved off to the side. So I'm just going to grab the DSN, and that's a unique identifier that tells the Sentry SDK where to send events. So whether it's error events, performance related events, attachments, sessions, all the stuff that the SDK does, it's gonna to send to this endpoint. We are not prescriptive about this. You can absolutely have three or four front ends send to the same project if you like. 
We don't tend to recommend that, but if you want to do that, feel free. We should have a project now over here called images, and you can see we have absolutely no activity yet. So let's get this turned on in our actual project. Let me flip over to VS Code. I have a simple React app here. And the first thing we need to do is take that DSN and I'm going to drop it into my environment variables. So let's do that. We are on a, uh, I am using Vite to do this. We support a number of bundler uh, convenience integrations. We'll talk about that in a minute and what that does, but um, I'm using Vite right now, as you can see with, uh, with these uh, prefaces here. So once we're done with that, I should have my DSN set up. And now I need to actually uh, add the Sentry init. So that boilerplate that we saw earlier is I'm just going to drop it right into my app.jsx. So we're going to do an import. And let me scroll back up to the top. I have this zoomed in a little bit. So hopefully when you guys are using VS Code, you're not this far zoomed in. But anyway, I'm importing the Sentry packages. So the base React package, as well as our performance uh, tracing product. Then we're doing a simple initialization. Here's where that DSN comes in and why I wanted to copy mine. So I don't have to type this all out. Uh, I'm uh, using a release. So I have a semantic release that's defined also within uh, my environment variables. Then I instrument uh, tracing here, which is for our performance product. Ben mentioned we're going to show replay. So I have that init set up here. Replay just allows you to see what the user sees on web front ends. So we'll be able to see all the clicks just like a video. So it essentially operates like a video player. And it also uh, interstitially adds in errors and performance uh, related data. So we'll see that when I uh, when we go into Sentry. A couple sample rates set up here. Not a big deal. They're just set to 100%. So we capture everything. And then lastly, when it comes to error monitoring, we get this question a lot. So I wanted to make sure to show it. All of our SDKs support this before send method. What this is doing is it essentially um, intercepts the event prior to it going out to Sentry. So you'll have, uh, if I were to console log this event, which I am, you would see the full JSON payload that's, get, that's getting sent to Sentry. And you can use that to do things like data scrubbing. So we get that question a lot. That's it. That's all I have to do. It's that simple. We did it in less than five minutes. Let me do a quick... Um, Let's run our, our dev server on this, and we should be able to see what we're creating here. So this is just a really simple gallery. And what it does is I can choose a file. And if I go down here, and let's pick something that looks kind of interesting. Uh, if I can find one that I actually want, uh, let's pick this JavaScript one here since we're talking about JavaScript. And I upload this. It's actually sending it off to Amazon Recognition. And it's detecting text. So it detected JS on the side and it detects what the image is uh, about, if you will. Behind the scenes, when we submit, so if I click on this button, it's going to submit an error to Sentry. So I'm just, I have a, uh, a class here, just an error class that I've customized. And what it does is it takes these tags and it creates Sentry tags out of them. So this is a big value prop and we'll see how this works uh, once we flip over to Sentry. I can, of course, browse around here if I want to. So the replay looks a little bit more interesting. But essentially, that's it. So super simple uh, gallery app that uh, uses fast API on the back end. Let's just make sure that this is the, the beginning part of this is working. So that's all it takes to wire this up. If I jump in here, we can go to our issues page. Sentry takes individual events, so individual errors that have the same fingerprint, and we bundle them into issues. And this is completely malleable. You can change this uh, however you like. So you can group your errors however however you want. And I think we have a number of errors here. So let me just refresh, make sure we're on the latest. Yep, so we got all of our stuff. And these are just some uh, informational messages that I'm posting. So you can post informational related issues, or you can have legitimate unhandled errors, which is that image we clicked on the Sentry Gold. If I wanted to, I can use that tag now. So if I wanted to use that tag, and let me see what that tag was. If we flip back over here, machine was the first tag. And I'm just using a keyword zero to one. And if I wanted to, let's say, filter that, I can use a tag to filter down to the uh, issues that have that tag attached. We'll talk a little bit more about why tags are useful in a moment, but let's just look at this error quickly, make sure that we're getting most of our stuff here. So it looks like we're getting quite a bit of information. I'm not going to go over everything in here right now. Uh, there are going to be a couple problems that we're introducing, and we're going to fix those, and then we'll come back to this page and take a look at how a typical developer workflow might look once you have it fully wired up. So if we just scroll down here, one thing I can see, we have a bit of a problem. So normally right here, we would see a full stack trace. Stack trace is just identifying the line of code 
where this error is occurring. And we don't see it right now. And there's a couple of reasons for that. But uh, the main reason is, is because we are one on a dev box, two, we're using uh, minified code, and three, we're not telling Sentry where our source maps are and where our original uh, JavaScript files are. So we'll fix that in a minute, and that Vite bundler will help us with that. We are getting a replay, so we stick the replays in here. We'll show that in a moment. We're getting a bunch of different tags. So all of this looks pretty good. Breadcrumbs is looking great. One thing I mentioned, we don't see any automatic assignment. Part of that is because we don't have GitHub wired. So we will use get our GitHub integration to showcase who is a potential assignee for this. And I'm not getting, as I mentioned before, you can see here, nothing is coming across in Slack. So our three main integrations are GitHub, Jira, and Slack. So let's see how we can get those working quickly. And then we will go fix our source map issue back in VS Code and do a full build and send source maps to Sentry. And then we can come back to one of these issues and see what the differences are once we've enabled those things. Our Slack integration is going to get set up. We've, we've already set it up, but I'm going to actually configure it in that alert. So before I do that, I'm going to go work on GitHub and then we'll come back and uh, adjust our alert to include Slack. To get to our integrations, those three top ones, all I have to do is go to settings down here and then integrations. And when I do that, I get Slack, GitHub, and Jira. I'm not going to go through the stepwise process of setting each of these up today. That would take entirely too long. So I've already gone through the base process from our docs of setting these up. I don't need to do anything with Slack here. We're going to use that again back in the alert section. But in GitHub, I do need to make a change. And that changes, given that we just created this project, I need to tell my existing GitHub configuration where my code is. All my repos have already been entered. This is the one that we're working with, this Quick Start Vic images. But I need to actually add a code mapping. You can see there's nothing mapped here. And this is what tells the integration which repo maps to which project within Sentry. So to do that, I simply add this mapping. There's our new project images. I can pick our V images repo. It automatically switches to main, which is my main branch. And then here, we'll talk about this once we've actually sent a full stack trace. You couldn't see it before because we didn't have a stack trace actually show up, but we do need to specify a stack trace route here. And this is probably going to differ per, uh, per your uh, environment but you will see this exact string at the top of the stack trace. If you run into problems with this mapping and, and some of the associated GitHub benefits, this is probably the, the problem is that you need to adjust your stack trace route and or your source code route. So this is the stack trace. This is actually the stack trace that's coming in. And this is the location of your source code within GitHub. Once I hit changes, that should be it for this particular integration. And if I wanna switch over now and fix our Slack uh, integration so that we get alerted in Slack for these new issues. All I need to do is go here to edit. And this is that this is that default alert that we set up earlier. This just is a when condition. There are lots of when conditions here. If you scroll down, you can see you can change it based on various conditions. I'm just going to leave it alone. When a new issue is created, we still want to be notified. You can use an optional if filter. And the one I like to point out here is the tags. So uh, one of our best practices is to avoid noisy issues, send in tags that are relevant for you. And then you can use tags all over Sentry to, to um, modify the behavior. So if I wanted to, I could have taken that key that we had earlier, and I could put it in here to limit the issues that are being sent. Now, what do I want to do when this matches, when all of this matches, what do I want to do with this? Well, it's already sending to me via email. I just want to add Slack. Slack has already been pre-configured. It knows my environment and I have a channel. All you need to do is say uh, what your channel channel is, and I'm going to choose Sentry and that's it. So I can send a test notification here to make sure this is actually working and it should find that Slack. And now I have a notification. And the only last thing I need to do, I can glance at the issues that would have been sent in the past. These are sent to my email right now, but they were not sent to Slack because we didn't have it turned on. And I can save that rule. Jira, I don't need to do anything with. That integration doesn't require a notification. You can automatically create Jira issues from alerts, however. So if you want to do that, feel free. That's another one of the options in the actions section. Let's fix the source map 
issue and do a build in Vite and see how that plugin helps us. So I'm going to flip back over to VS Code. Let's turn off our dev box now, our dev server. We'll clear off the console. And I'm just going to point out that this vite.config.js, if you're familiar with these tools, they usually have some kind of config. And we have a plugin that helps us with this. So you can kind of see I'm pulling in those same environment variables. I want to target a particular project, in this case, images with a particular release. We have an auth token here that allows us to access the API to upload source maps, and then some basic source map configuration. And the plugin will intelligently go find all of our source map and uh, source code, and it will send it to Sentry. So if I say, if I do a build here, it's going to go through. And if I make this a little bit bigger, you'll see uh, the magic that the uh, plugin does. So all this in that sort of lime green looking text, this is all... Um, this is all the, the stuff that's being sent, if you will. And then you can see minified and source maps were all sent over. And if I do an NPM run preview and we run off of our build, now I can fire this up again in our browser. Uh, there we go. I can close the old one since it's shut down. We can get back to this. So I could send in another issue here if I want to. Maybe I'll do century rolls and I can do one here. So we send a couple issues in. And now let's go look at the changes that we've made. So first of all, I can see that I got a Slack notification already. Uh, and that was one for, uh, that was the test that we did. We should have uh, more coming in. So you can see in real time, they came in. If I wanted to now, I could go ahead and assign that. So if I wanted to assign George, let's say to this one, I'll leave this one blank. We'll look at it here in a second. So that's all working. So we got Slack working. Uh, if I jump back over here now to issues and we refresh, you can see I have a whole bunch of new issues that have come in and you'll notice something over here. This is the one we assigned via Slack. So that's part of the benefit of Slack is I can automatically work on issues within Slack. In addition, this is a suggested assignee based on commit data. So you'll notice before we didn't have these, but now that we've wired up GitHub, I get some uh, additional information on suggested assignees. Let's jump into this century time zone one. Now I can see some additional benefits that we get from turning this on. One, I get suspect commits. So suspect commits are taking git blame and they're trying to determine which potential um, uh, commit might have been the root of this problem. So it's trying to determine where this uh, century time zone issue was where it started from. So this is a big value add for us. Um, we make this should make it easier for you to narrow down where a particular issue uh, is sourced from. In the assigned, we had a suggested assignee. I can also click on this little gear, and Sentry provides rules that you can use in order to auto assign uh, assignees or teams. In addition, you can use code owners to do this as well. So if you're using code owners in GitHub, once you wire up the GitHub integration, uh, you can actually specify code owners, and we can uh, use the code owner rules to assign issues automatically. If we go down here, then I can see, aha, uh -huh, now I have a full stack trace. I have my class that I have um, issued uh, or that I've created to issue these errors. And I can open this uh, line in GitHub. So if I want to open this up, it'll take me directly to the line of code within GitHub. From a developer workflow standpoint, if I'm, I've got all the context I need from all the custom tags I put in, I've looked at breadcrumbs, maybe I've looked at replay, I've looked at the stack trace. Let's say I'm ready to actually assign this. You can do that via JIRA. It's a bi-directional integration. So all I need to do is fill this all out. It's going to give you some uh, pre, uh, pre, I guess, loaded information based on the error. You can, of course, fill out any of these other fields. I do need to provide a reporter for this. It's a required field. So if I do that and I hit Dirk and create issue, I'll pivot back over now to JIRA, which I have up here, and we should see that issue comes in. So uh, if I click on this issue now, Let's say I've worked on this. We've got lots of comments, you know, the typical Jira workflow. Maybe we pushed a fix and I can hit done. This is a bi-directional integration. So if I jump back over to Sentry, now if I go up to the top and I refresh this, you're going to see this issue actually gets resolved. So that's directly correlated to that Jira integration. And you can see the Jira issue tracking number on the bottom here changes from Jira to the actual uh, issue. And then lastly, if I jump in now, I can actually look at a full replay of everything that has happened up to this point. So if I want to, I can hit play. And now we're going to see, if I pause this just for a second, uh, you can see I have a full representation of my gallery. It will show you uh, all of what the user is doing. In addition, it will show you up here errors uh, within that given replay. 
And then finally, I can go over here. And because we have full tracing turned on, I can see the front end to back end correlation of my, uh, my, two, uh, my two projects. In addition, I can see that an error was correlated to this. So uh, this all appears to be working uh, perfectly. Uh, so that's really all it takes in order to get the basics of Sentry working. We covered how to set up a project initially, how to set up those init parameters, how to send in some custom tags. Lastly, I just wanted to mention tags are probably the uh, least mentioned but most useful tool that we provide. If you send them in, we have them both on errors as well as performance transactions, and they work not only in this alerts area that we saw, but they also work in our query tool, which is called Discover, as well as dashboards. So what we see a lot of customers doing to get the most out of errors is they send in a lot of contextual tags, and then they use those to set up custom queries. So you can use custom queries to count the number of issues relative to a tag. Let's say you had an app and you had silver, gold, and platinum members, and maybe the platinum members have special features that the silver ones don't get. Maybe I want to send in a tag that indicates an error that's happening to my platinum customers, for example, or maybe performance-related transactions on a platinum customer. And you can set up custom dashboards that are just oriented on those platinum customers. Uh, and then, of course, you could get alerts on those as well if you wanted to. So. In any case, that kind of rounds out the basics of getting up and running. I think my timer here says about 18 minutes. So I'm going to shut it down now and we'll go over to some questions uh, if you have any. And uh, I'm happy to come back in here and point out anything else in the UI. Uh, but I wanted to, in the interest of time, let's uh, see what questions we gave come in. Hey, Dirk, one question that came in through the chat was yeah. um, how to set up source maps for production code where the source map is not generated um i probably need some additional uh, some additional clarity you would need to generate a source map so i'm not sure i'm not sure exactly what that means maybe if there's some additional color but you would need something in your build process has to generate the source map right we can't guess uh we can't guess it, those so typically a build tool is going to provide you those but mm -hmm. like and, and that's what our beat like, for example, the plugin is for, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when I did the Vite, so Vite is going to have, uh, if I flip back over to uh, VS Code, and, and again, this is a, a ultra simple project to understand, but you are going to have to have some kind of, typically a build tool, not, I'm not familiar with all of them, uh, but typically you're going to have some kind of uh, some kind of directive within the, uh, within the config to say, I need source maps generated. Um, now, there are some questions um, we do have some convenience features around source maps that we are just rolling out that use debug ID to prevent you from having to necessarily upload um, as many source maps. So sometimes we run into people uh, with who do you know hourly builds and they don't want to upload source maps for every one of them. It's too costly to do it. Um, we do give some convenience features for that, but that's probably beyond the scope of this. But we do have docs. So if you go out and look up um, source maps and debug ID for Century, you'll find the docs on on some of the changes that we're making here. I uh, just got some clarification just on that one specifically mm -hmm. around source maps. Uh, Marco is asking, can I deploy the production source map into a place and combine uh, with Sentry? Maybe that's something we can follow up. Um, yeah, maybe we'll send out some uh, more details on source maps to the, yeah. to the attendees. Yeah. No other questions? So, we don't have uh, there's a question from... <laughs> There's a question from uh, Sandra. Actually, we're starting to get quite a few questions coming in. Uh, okay. Uh, can you explain more if I create a different project for different environments, such as staging and production? Uh -huh. I believe she's asking, how do you specify that? Yeah, and you can send that in. So you don't have to specify different projects for that. You can actually, if you're in a project, so let's say I'm in my images project, we give you the ability to send in environments. Uh, on a given project. So uh, we didn't cover this, but you can filter down. I'd, I only have production set up here, but you can set up different environments. That's part of the initialization. So you absolutely can do that. And we'll detect that when you send it in. So you would just have a different uh, param that comes across in your Q&A environment, for example, or maybe you know some kind of uh, unit test integ or integration testing environment, or maybe you have a you know RC related environment. So you can absolutely have different environments. And we have customers that, that get very clever on how they use environments. Some people do it, for example, by market. So I have a customer that uses environments to filter by market. 
Got it. Thanks. Uh, mm -hmm. Quite a few other questions coming in now. Uh, and just so everybody knows for specifically how to configure uh, particular frameworks, we'll send out some uh, links to docs and some blogs and whatnot that are going to walk you through step by step yeah. uh, how, how to do that. Uh, one question that came in is, is there a way to control which errors get sent to Sentry? For example, would it be possible to only send browser CSP errors? Yeah. You can do that through that before send method that I mentioned before. So if you're in here and we're in app.jsx, you could set up, we, we use this method, this before send. You can do two things. There's, uh, depending on the framework that you're using, you can actually filter out errors. So there's a separate method to do that. So you can actually ignore errors uh, or you can use before send and just say, uh, put an if condition in here or some sort of tertiary function that says, you know, if I see a certain signature or a certain piece of data that comes across, just don't send it. Or, or the inverse, of course, you could just say, just send only this particular error uh, to Sentry. That's absolutely doable. We have people do that all the time. Another question that came in, are there any privacy considerations for the video replay feature? Yeah, there are tons of them. So I didn't cover this in detail, but let's cover it really quickly. I unmasked and unblocked all of the media and text that's coming across. You can absolutely use these init features to turn this back to true. By default, it's going to be set at the most restrictive privacy settings. You can also use classes to do this, which I prefer because I think it gives you more control. You can define those classes here in the init, or you can take, we have three different classes that you can use to mask, block, and ignore. And you can use those classes to drop it directly into you know, whatever, whatever you're using to manage your CSS, but they're just CSS classes. And if it sees that, um, when the replay goes through, it sees that CSS class, it will just automatically mask it. So that's, uh, yeah, we have, uh, I would say probably industry leading masking ability. The last question we always get on this is, does, is that just being obfuscated uh, sort of in a false way, meaning we're Sentry is still getting that data under the covers. We're just in the UI, we're just masking it. And the answer is no. If you do it here in your init and or in your CSS, we'll, Sentry will never see that information. It will get um, the, the outbound to the Sentry SaaS product will be the obfuscation if you're using uh, a masking technique for that. So it'll just look like asterisks basically. Another question that came in, what's the difference between the stack trace and the source root? Is the former some kind of directory with log info managed by Sentry? Yeah, I'm not sure how to answer that the best way. The stack trace is probably the place to start here. If I'm in a given issue, uh, to, get to, to get to the specific line of code, um, we see the stack trace of the error. Uh, I'm not sure. The other part I'm guessing was related to the GitHub configuration. And that is, uh, we didn't talk about this, I actually completely forgot about it, but this is that path that we mentioned, that dot, dot, uh, dot, dot source. Um, this has to match. So basically we link, if you will, the GitHub repo for this particular project. And then uh, by virtue of doing that, we get a lot of these other nice uh, capabilities and features, one of which is uh, we can link off to that line in GitHub. So the only thing that, that source map uh, linking is doing is allowing us to see where this line of code is in your original repo. And that works, by the way, pretty much generically for, for most of our integrations. So you can use that for Python. If I, if I was in my Python project, I would see exactly the same thing, and I could link off to the, the Python line of code uh, for that fast API. I'm not sure that answers the question, but we'll follow up with some additional information on, on the GitHub and uh, source code mapping. Lots of lots of questions coming in here. Uh, one, uh, I'm not answering around... them well. That's why. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. Uh, the one question is: Is it possible to send air data to Grafana? Yeah, yeah, we have a Grafana integration, uh, so you can do that through the same settings issue uh, settings area so if i go to integrations and we have a ton of integrations i'm not going to scroll down the list but i have grafana installed it will send uh um i've got two of them by the way i've got one for webhook and then one for uh, the actual integration and if you go in here you can set it up and visualize data in sentry uh, it's enabled and it will send issues off to sentry it does not send the atomic uh, transactions, because that could be tens and thousands and thousands of transactions. So it just sends the issue. Um, so you can absolutely group uh, group issues uh, within Grafana. They actually just released a new version of this maybe two months ago. So it's working pretty well now as of last time I tested it. All right, everyone, we are 
right up on time. Uh, one last question for you, Dirk. Yeah. Can we universally mask test text and not allow code to override mask all test false? Mm, I might need some clarification on that. I'm not clear if that's one of the replay settings or if we're just talking about generic. Um, so you can, I guess, the, the two ways to think about this is we can do uh, we can do uh, masking on on a per project basis within Sentry, what we call server side uh, filtering and masking. So you can uh, we have those capabilities, and then in that uh, before send method, you can do whatever you like with the error. So all that data for for error and transactions that's all going to be available to you within before send. When you intercept that event message in before send, you can mask everything if you want to, or you can drop entire nodes of JSON if you don't want nodes in there. So really, we give you the ability to, to, to manipulate that error data however you like. I guess I would say one thing you should be careful of, you don't want to remove so much data or mask so much data that you're not getting any value out of Sentry. So you, you definitely want to keep enough where you get the stack trace and then uh, breadcrumbs and context, and then any tags that you want, because if you remove too much, you're not, it's not going to be that useful to you for error triaging. Hopefully that makes sense. 